Hello, everyone, and welcome to Bird Process Equipment's uh, educational webinar on Chem Plus and uh, Polymer Plus chemical feed and polymer activation and injection systems. I'm Mark Trujenti, the Director of Design Engineering for Bird Process Equipment, um, and I want to welcome everyone for joining us today uh, from across the country. And um, so we're going to keep this kind of casual um, on the cruise of the webinar, but uh, we do have a, a, a questions um, tab. If anybody has any questions, feel free to type them in there, and we will try to answer them as we go along during the broadcast. Any questions which we do not answer during the broadcast, we will transmit out. There will be a follow-up survey that will come after this webinar, and this webinar is being recorded. So a link to that can also be shared uh, by those who wish to see it, um, should they have to uh, exit the webinar at any time prior to doing that. Uh, and if you are a member of a person who we can get uh, PDH credit hours to, those will be sent out, um, the certificates will be sent out uh, after the broadcast here in the next week or so. So without further ado, uh, let's kind of get into this. And what we're going to do is we're, kind of, we're going to break this presentation down really into uh, two different parts. Um, because while these systems are ultimately related um, in, in their applications, chemical injection and, and polymer uh, activation injection in some cases, there also are examples where one is really just used predominantly. Chemical, uh, chem plus chemical injection systems are the much broader topic. Um, they fall into a lot of different industries, including municipal, um, you know, industrial, um, food processing, things, you know, pharmaceutical, things like that. Whereas Polymer Plus is a little bit more of a specialized market, uh, for sure. So we're going to kind of talk about these as kind of two separate entities, and we'll also discuss kind of how they're how they are related. And the first one we're going to that we're going to talk about is Polymer Plus Polymer Activation Systems. So. We're going to start with a little bit of basic chemistry. I'm not going to spend a lot of time um, over the course of this presentation really delving into the into the finer points of polymers or polymer chemistry in general. Um, but just looking at it from kind of a high level standpoint, polymers are long chain molecules, and the polymers that we're talking about today are like emulsion based polymers, cationic polymers, manic polymers which are used essentially in binding to other species which are found in water, such as suspended particles. And this action allows and really allows for settling. So this is really used as a water clarification chemistry um, or solution clarification chemistry where the actual polymer is injected, which then adds mass to the target species for which you are then trying to remove. And polymers can be negatively charged, they can be positively charged, anionic and cationic, or they could be neutral as well. And because polymers react with water, and the species of, of water, when they're processed, and we're gonna talk about really two different ones, but what we're talking about here is really liquid-based polymers. We'll talk about solid polymers as well um, a little bit later on. Because they interact with different species in water, they have to be shipped in a medium that allows them to to allow them um, to be kept for use, and that tends to be a oil-based solution or an emulsification droplet, whereby the polymer is basically emulsified um, in a small amount of water. And so, in order to really utilize the polymer, what these systems do is they have to strip away they have to strip away that oil and then activate the polymer to allow it for actual use. Within, within your process So that is a common what they, what they call polymer activation um, or polymer mixing. And there really are three kind of broad categories that polymer activation fall into. And really what you really want to achieve is a fully activated polymer. And the reason you want to do this is the more activated the polymer is, which means that it's fully elongated, and that all of its sites are active, this allows for the most efficient when it's injected into your stream process for adding that suspension to your, to your fluid solution. If you end up with an underexposure, as you can see here on the right, your polymer is kind of like, it's still kind of bound up. So think about a polymer kind of like a long string of spaghetti, essentially. So when it's kind of in the pot, you want that nice long piece um, that you can kind of throw against the wall, that's what you want to be able to throw into your solution so it can fully wrap around and bond. 
if it's not fully activated, it's kind of like a clumpy ball, and that limits your exposure to the various sites in the polymer, which can then be used for binding to your actual um, species that you're trying to target. On the flip side, polymers are very, very sensitive. They're basically large carbon chain molecules. And essentially, the very force of heavy rain on a, on a solution of polymer can actually break thousands of carbon bonds. That's how sensitive polymers actually are. And carbon backbone is really the backbone of any polymer chain system. So if you overexpose a polymer, it's basically like shredding your spaghetti. You know, these little pieces that are very inefficient because they don't have that long chain to allow them to bond and wrap around that suspension um, as, as is required. So it's kind of a balancing act for trying to activate polymer systems between getting the fully activated version that you want and then overexposing it to a lot of mixing energy, which can end up with a situation where the polymer chain is really no longer useful. So you're going to end up using a lot more polymer over the course of your processing. So how, so how this process really unfolds is you have your polymer and you have to then agitate it by the expo while exposing it to water. And this activation energy that you put into it basically causes that emulsion to break. The oil still somewhat remains, but then the polymer begins to basically unbond. And then it begins basically actually working initially with the water that you actually use to separate it, and then it's injected into your chemical process um, on the right, it's injected into your chemical process C. On the right, you can see this is kind of what an emulsion looks like. You can see kind of the outer oil circles, and then the, the inside you basically have your fluid or liquid droplets. So there's a couple of different technologies out there on the market which are utilized uh, for polymer activation. In brick process equipment, we use a high energy hydrodynamic polymer activation system. A lot of the more traditional polymer systems used to rely basically on basically on like mixing chambers or actually putting some kind of actual impeller in there, which would cause that cavitational energy that would allow the polymer to then be separated out. The problem with putting using a mechanical device is this can often lead to that higher level of shearing, which you would not want to achieve um, within your polymer system. So if you look here on the right, of the, of the slide, you can actually see that's actually the polymer chamber here in the corner. This is actually the polymer injection. This is just the sight glass here. You can actually see um, the activated polymer as it passes through the system. You have your different polymer injection pumps, in case of metering pump. In this case, you have more progressive cavity style pump. And then this is your city water feed or whatever your water source feed is. And that pressure coming in, blending with the injected polymer, is forced up into the is forced up into the forced up into the hydro uh, mixing chamber, which allows for that high level of activation. And we're going to show that a little more clearly if you look at a couple of P and IDs here in a moment. So, what is a motorless activation? It essentially acts like a high-speed ductor, and you can kind of see a graphic here on the right. You have your polymer coming in, and then you have your water coming in here, and you're basically forcing it through. A, a basically pushing it through this very, very small chamber here, which has a spring and a ball, and it basically causes the water to then spin on its own. Basically, basically, basically it's going through like an inductor at an extremely high speed. So you end up getting a fluid velocity of approximately 40 feet per second as you go through this basically very narrow nozzle. Because there's, but all you're doing is basically spinning the water in the polymer. There's nothing actually spinning in the chamber with it. And this causes a very, very high degree of activation going into your system. So this is actually the very bottom piece of that little gray device I was showing you. That's actually the polymer activation chamber. And this here below it, let me get my mouse here, actually shows how the pollen and the water come in. They're mixed and then allowed to actually leave. Um, yes, you can basically see the visible polymer leaving the actual system. So, Modulus activation to kind of summarize, accelerates the solution to a very high speed, 40 feet per second, which is very high as far as a Reynolds number calculation. This generates a very high level of activation, 
And again, how do you do this? So how much polymer you add, how much water you need, how much water pressure you need, really does depend on your polymer chemistry. And we, you know, this could be a whole separate webinar. We can sit down and we can talk about some of the different polymers that are out there and kind of the dosages that, that you would need, but it is very specific um, to the actual application. So in most cases, um, polymer treatment is, tends to be best, tends to be bench tested um, before utilizing a system like this in order to achieve the most optimal results within your, within your system. So um, different polymers will require different pressures, different inlets, and, and, as well as different flow rates. Some people are still concerned that they do need uh, mechanical agitation as well. Some polymers do blend differently than others, as I just kind of said. Um, so it is kind of important to know that you can do a combination system. Some people will do um, the hydrodynamic activation system, and then they'll and then they'll follow that up with a more traditional hydromechanical device or even a polymer aging tank. Um, as a means to achieve a higher level of activation. So in the first stage, the problem is injected into the stream and passes through the high energy activation nozzle, the hydrodynamic, and then either goes into the more mechanical device or into an aging tank. And for those of you who are unaware, um, polymer aging was a little bit separate from the idea of polymer activation. So what, what polymer aging is, is the polymer once activated is put into a holding vessel and it's typically agitated, and over time, this will allow the polymer to open up a little bit further, basically expand. If it wasn't fully activated um, in the actual in, in the actual activation device, whether that be a mixer or that be um, be the um, the hydrodynamic activation system, there are pros and cons to utilizing aging tanks, and one is obviously cost. You know, you have a very simple device here where you have a water inlet and you have a polymer injection pump and you go through and you activate it. And on the flip side, now you're adding a tank, level controls, mixers, um, basically hold this polymer and then repressurizing it again for actual use. The second downside is while your polymer is opening up, it can also react with species in your water. If you're using a city water source as an example, uh, for your polymer activation, you have a lot of chlorides, for example, in there. You can begin to oxidize some of the different sites. If you have, other, if you have suspended solids, if your water is not a very good source, it'll actually begin to bond to those species as opposed to opening up in the actual aging process. So aging is kind of a mixed bag. And it really should be evaluated, one, based on cost, and two, based on how much polymer you really need to use, as well as your water quality. Aging of polymers is fairly common when you're talking about dry polymer activation systems, which we're going to look at here in a couple of minutes. So as I mentioned earlier, this, this is the device located above the polymer activation chamber. This is basically just a sight glass here, where you can actually see some of the polymer coming out. You can see an example here on the right. Um, this, is the, this, is the, this is the activation chamber here, and this is just a sight glass coming out here. In this case, we're utilizing a hose pump. A lot of different technologies can be utilized, uh, different pumping technologies can be utilized uh, in polymer activation systems. So what we've done is we really, bird process is basically pre-packaged together a polymer activation system. And really what we have, the, the actual polymer activation chamber, we, we include the city water feed. We also include city water booster pumps if required. If your city water feed pressure is too low, uh, it's very common to put a small city water booster pump down here uh, to allow for a higher flow. Um, or sufficient pressure to get into your system. Typically, the system operated at about 80 pounds of pressure uh, feeding into the actual polymer chamber uh, for, the, for, the, for the water side. Different control options here from simple relay logic all the way up to full PLC, as well as different options like redundant pumps can also be involved uh, with these systems. And flow rates range quite a bit. Polymer, you don't use a lot of it. Um, actually, sometimes the more polymer you add, the, the, actual, the actual worse you can get. 
Um, there is kind of a balance here where we're really adding polymer. Anybody who has a swimming pool probably knows this one. A lot of times people will use polymers to help kind of clarify their swimming pool. If you put too much polymer in, um, the polymer basically begins to bond to itself. And what ends up happening is you end up with this kind of large, cloudy, essentially amorphous blob that basically moves through your water. And it's very hard to actually get rid of that once it's in there and it isn't really doing anything. It's not actually achieving the goal of allowing for that solid suspension or clarification you're trying to achieve. It's just now this kind of a Mickey was blob of polymer essentially in your system. So I've been sensing these gallons per day is quite a bit. Most polymer systems operate very, very low. Polymer tends to be one of the chemicals you don't want to necessarily use a lot of in your system. Looking at this from a PNID standpoint, uh, on the right here, this is where your city water comes in, your water supply comes in, goes to a strainer. You can have a flow meter here as well. You have a solenoid control valve, which is tied into when the polymer system is, is in operation. This is where your polymer injection comes in here. And the two basically meet, and this is your activation apparatus. There's a little um, inductor device. Goes up, goes through your side glass, and then this is discharged out. If you have sufficient pressure, this can go right into your processy. If not, then this will go into a blending, just go into another tank for then further processing with, with a device such as like a chemical feed based system. Um, one of the most common types of pumps which is utilized uh, for polymers is a progressive cavity, such as a niche progressive cavity pump. And it's because polymers themselves, their viscosity can vary tremendously. But sometimes you will use like medium pumps, other people will use, especially on larger ones, uh, progressive cavity or even screw type pumps. Uh, the other more common one is also a hose style pump, but progressive cavity and metering pumps are definitely two of the most common uh, types of pumps utilized on polymer transfer uh, and activation systems. This is just an example here uh, where you're showing more of, a, more of a progressive cavity pump. Again, you have your solenoid valve coming up here, feeding your city water. And then here you just have a different kind of like a progressive cavity style pump transferring out into your system uh, where you have your activation chamber located down here. So some of the different options which are available on these. Um, you know, increased dilution capacity, you know, up to 120 or more gallons per minute, a high flow polymer capacity, different metering pumps, four to 20 controls on those, uh, aging and blending chambers, which we, which we had talked about previously, polymer flow readings, um, sometimes you do go into explosion proof assemblies, this is very common in different industrial plants where they're utilized, high pressure applications, and then, and then again, custom PLC controls as well. This is just one example here is a clarifier, a very common application for polymer injection systems. You can see there's a polymer injection system installed in the field here on the right. Um, this one, because it, because it is a municipal plant, they actually want to go with some level of redundancy in these systems. So they put uh, two polymer transfer pumps. You can see the polymer activation chamber. This unit was also built with a full double containment in case there are any leaks in the system, um, also by bird process equipment. This whole kind of essentially package can be built um, either per the specifications of the plant or by our own recommendations um, for a complete package system. In addition to liquid polymer systems, we also, uh, Burr Process um, also does make dry polymer based systems. And kind of the pros and cons of using liquid versus dry polymer is kind of an owner preference uh, or user preference for the most part. Um, dry polymer is if you need a lot of polymer, it's easier to buy bulk dry polymer as opposed to buying, you know, gallons of liquid polymer. But the actual apparatuses utilized um, are a little bit different. If you have to get the polymer basically from the solid then into the solution uh, for makeup and then go through more of a chemical, um, and then go through more of a chemical injection system like a Chem Plus, you don't have the same concerns as far as, as, far as polymer activation when looking at a system. Uh, that's utilizing dry. So typically these are one or two tank systems whereby you have a means of transferring the polymer into a water solution, into the tank for blending, aging, and transfer. 
you know, there's a few different ways. Um, you can use an inductor-based system, where you actually, which works kind of similar to how the activation chamber works, where you have a slip, you have an actual stream of water, which is going to be filling into your into your blending tank, and the polymer is allowed to then be injected in at a dry, disperses through it, goes into the tank where it's then held. Or you can do more of a hopper or auger type device, uh, which you can see there on the right, where the polymer is put in and then it's allowed to transfer up through an auger-based system into a tank. One thing to note about dry polymer is dry polymer can be very sensitive to moisture in the air. Uh, it can begin to clump, it can begin to um, activate. So it is important to using kind of an open cavity device, like a hopper that you have like a moisture system, you know, moisture based system in there, or that you keep it dry um, to prevent that from happening uh, within your actual system. So dehumidification, uh, low humidity air, things like that are also very common uh, when trying to use a hopper based system. But still, it's a very good device when you have very bring you a lot of bulk polymer injection. And you see another one. This is, this is a disc feeder type device. So a disc feeder is essentially has like a vacuum type device that essentially sucks the polymer um, off of basically a disc where basically the polymer is first basically put on there and then basically it's transferred by like a vacuum suction into your actual chemical, into your actual blending tank. Uh, to allow for use. And you can kind of see a close up here how that operates. Dry polymer feeds kind of dropped on there, typically based on like a weight or a level based measurement. You have the proximity sensors there, which actually measure the polymer. And then you have a vacuum inductor, which basically transfers the polymer uh, from that disc based device then into your blending tank. This is a couple of different examples here to kind of show, and obviously this looks quite a bit different um, than how a lot of the liquid-based polymer systems operate. So here in the example on the left, um, you have a giant polymer feeder, which you draw up, and then you have like a polyductor or something where the water is transferred through, again, just space city water, it blends and gets put into the tank where it's agitated to allow for mixing. Again, things to be done carefully, it's not to shoot a mixer. This is also the aging tank. Aging, as I mentioned before, um, is a process where the polymer is allowed to sit for an amount of time, and that does depend on the polymer anywhere from, you know, 20, 30 minutes up to a couple of hours. And is then transferred into the pump tank where it's then transferred for actual use. Um, this case here is kind of a very similar setup. So if you have one tank, you have the polymer coming in by, by an auger system with your city water feed, going into a mixing section, to an aging section, and then going into a pumping section. So you need a lot more equipment um, when you deal with dry polymer as opposed to liquid polymer. Liquid polymer can be a very simple system where you're drawing off of a, you know, a polymer drum, you have a city water connection, you make up your polymer through the hydrodynamic activator and it goes right into your process. And doing with the dry polymer based system, you have a multi tank configuration. You have a different, you have a lot, you, you have to have the storage capacity for the different sacks or super sacks of polymer or drums. You need hoppers or transfer equipment to get those solids, blend them, and then use them. Um, so, one of the questions we actually got during this is kind of, you know, what's really the advantage of dry over liquid? The advantage of dry polymer over liquid polymer is that dry polymer you can you can store for a lot longer liquid polymer tends to have a much shorter activated life so you tend to really buy as you need it essentially whereas dry polymer that's kept it's kept in it's kept, it's kept in, a, in in a humidity controlled environment can allow you to store a lot more polymer on site it can also be helpful when you're utilizing a lot more if you have an application where you need a lot more polymer going with a dry polymer based system can be very helpful in those cases so with a liquid based polymer system you tend to end up with it's, it's a lot less equipment generally less cost effective to utilize um but also has the advantage but but at the same time it's kind of it's, you have to kind of constantly keep bringing in liquid chemical and some people also just don't like handling liquids you know there's a lot is a lot easier safety handling in the facility 
when utilizing a dry polymer as opposed to a liquid polymer system. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we're going to kind of switch. We're going to kind of talk about in sort of two different sections. We just kind of cover through the polymer injection, polymer plus system. Uh, and here now we're going to kind of move more into the, the chemical feed system. And as, as I mentioned, these two types of systems, um, they're related because they're using a lot of the same products um, in a lot of the same facilities. But chem feed systems are a much, much broader topic. Um, so your know, polymer activation is utilizing clarification, um, emulsification, solid separation. Can feed really, really, really runs the gambit um, from municipal treatment to process to pH adjustment to food processing um, to a lot, you know, to you know, even specialty oil and gas operations. You can see the picture there on the right of the outside base systems. So what we're going to kind of highlight here is sort of like what's involved in a chemical feed system, and kind of what they are, what are the major components, where are they utilized, talk a little bit about some of the different pumping technologies, and then kind of look at a lot of different applications, some standard and some custom, um, of how these different systems are utilized. So what is a chemical feed system? Well, in a very broad sense, a chemical feed system is a device is, is, a, is a device utilized to do precision injection of a chemical into a stream or a tank. And these can be simplex, these can be duplex, these can be triplex, they can be um, lead lag duplex, they can be high flow, they can be low flow. It really depends on the application. So here you can kind of see in, on the left a very, very broad look at what a chem feed system here. I have some chemical tank. I have my injection pump. In this case, I'm showing a metering pump, uh, relief valve, pulsation dampeners, and then it goes in and injects into, in this case, my stream. Well, this would be um, magnesium chloride, hypochlorite, uh, metamisulfite, paracetic acid, you know, or just sulfuric acid. This is the kind of fundamentals of what a chemical feed system is, and where really a lot of, a lot of, a lot of the um, technology that goes into these systems is in the type of pump technology utilized and then building the actual device for the specific application, whether it be an explosion proof device, whether it be PLC based controls, uh, whether it has to go into a clean room environment or some kind of CGMP space, or whether it's utilized in more of a municipal application, um, it really does run the gamut. So here on the right, you can see this is a fairly standard chem feed system, simplex, and then over here, a more and more custom one. This is utilizing gear pump as an example. So, where are these systems utilized? I talked about this a little bit before. Municipal water disinfection, pH adjustment, fluoride addition, hydrofluoric acid is added a lot of times to water. That's so why you have the fluoride in the water. Uh, wastewater, odor control, pH adjustment. Um, clean in place in the food and beverage or pharmaceutical, sterilization, institutional cooling towers, boiler treatment, um, oil and gas. Um, a lot of it has to do with disinfecting the pipelines or the cooling waters in those systems. So they are utilized in a lot, a lot of different applications. That's why it's such a broad range. That's why there's also some differences in kind of how they're approached from different industries, and municipal. There's kind of one way to the design, and then an industrial is kind of a different way that you know, different way that chemical feed systems are looked at um, as more of a process equipment as opposed to more of just a pump, which they are in lots of in the municipal environments. So for process equipment, um, we, we've been doing chemical feed systems now for about 20 years. We designed a kind of a a customizable standard for what can be utilized for chemical injection systems. So you can kind of see here on the right, um, this is kind of the um, standard chemical feed arrangement. This in this case is a duplex arrangement. Uh, we build these entire systems on a single half inch HDPE corrosion resistant base with a leak pan here at the bottom. Whether it's simplex, duplex, or triplex, you have uh, elevated mounted pumps. 
you have your flow verification, ball valves, just treating as well as degassing, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Calibration columns, pressure relief valves, uh, back pressure, pulsation dampeners, and then you have either common or separated discharge here in your calibration column. So it comes with a prepackaged unit um, with an integral junction box um, that can be installed for a wide variety of applications. Type of materials that are available changes depending upon the chemical, PVC, CPVC, stainless steel, uh, Kynar PVDF, polypropylene, Hastelloy C, um, whether or not this is heat traced, that all comes into, you know, what type of chemicals, what kind of flow rates we're dealing with. Same thing with the different pumps. Metering pumps are utilized. Um, air operated diaphragm pumps can be utilized in these systems. Other types of peristaltic pumps, such as plunger pumps, um, gear pumps. Um, so there's a lot of variation depending on the type of chemicals or, or things we're utilizing. Just to kind of summarize what I just said, half inch, you know, the, you know, the entire base construction, um, schedule 80 piping. In this case, this is actually all PVDF piping here. In this case, this is actually an explosion proof unit or that metering pump is actually explosion proof in that case. Um, very common requirement of the oil and gas industry. Um, when you're talking and, and oil rigs and things like that have a lot of chemical feed systems on them. That's why explosion proof is actually fairly common in a lot of those cases. In the um, chemical label plaques, double containment, calibration columns. So, as I mentioned before, a lot of different public technologies, probably the most common would be um, a metering-based pump, electronic-based metering pump, whether that's going to be solenoid or motor-driven. Um, but again, you know, progressive cavity, peristaltic gear, and diaphragm are also fairly common. Maybe some of the more custom things that can be involved with these systems. Um, the state can be, you know, standard ones polyethylene, the more custom ones can be polypropylene, stainless steel, or fiberglass. A lot of different custom control options, full PLC integration is also available. And these systems are entirely hydro tested. I'm going to show a quick video here that kind of highlights um, one of the nice features that we have on these systems, which is the um, self closing cabinet based doors. We put a lot of different shields um, on these systems, whether they're more of a cabinet based design, such as this case here, you can see in the video as well as on the right or if they are more of the um, kind of the, um, the base model I was just showing you. In this case here, you have PVC or Lexan shield, uh, which have different lockable points. Very good when you have a room concern, because they basically, just basically a bifold of a closet essentially that can be locked. And they provide a nice thing for spray protection as well as some level of double containment uh, in the system. As well as if it doesn't have to go outside, it also does offer some protection against the elements as well. Taking a look at a few of the different features that go into these systems. So within the actual Chem Plus system, um, there are a couple of different kind of standards, a couple of different standard accessories which, are, which tend to be added to these systems. Um, one of the most common is a pressure relief valve. And pressure relief valves um, are designed for overpressurization of your piping system. So in the event that you do have a metering pump or if it's a, an AOD or gear pump, what you basically have is a device that coming off of your pump is very often your pump can run at a much higher pressure um, than your actual root tank or pipe that you're trying to inject into the various chemistries. This allows you, if this is ever cut off a block, to just basically open up a valve and allow it to basically recirculate. You don't risk damaging your downstream piping system uh, or you do have a lot of chemical handling, obviously, in these systems. Back pressure valves, and some people like back pressure valves and some people don't like back pressure valves. Back pressure valves can help improve repeatability on your system because again, if you're pumping directly from um, a chemical tank or, or larger chemical storage tank, and you're pumping up into an atmosphere tank, there's very little back pressure on those systems. So a lot of the older or simpler metering pumps that are out there, 
they want to, they definitely, they like to put a back pressure valve on there because it does improve some of the repeatability to create an artificial back pressure on the pump. But at the same time, it also, it also helps prevent back, it also helps prevent siphoning, which can occur where you literally draw water out of the source back through the pump. Um, so again, another kind of safety feature involved in these different systems. One of the smaller metering pumps on the market, um, this is really only applies to metering pumps in this case. They they have they, a lot of them used to have multifunction valves, which kind of included that bag pressure, anti siphon priming, and draining. They're they're still available. They're not as common as they used to be, and um, a lot of times they're only utilized on very small pumps that maybe are you know under say under 20 gallons per hour. If you're going into pumps which are much larger in this case, then you would definitely need to look at having um, uh, having a lot of these, so you wouldn't even necessarily need to have a back pressure pressure relief valve. So you do have this nice kind of feature. A lot of times they also used to have a six function valve which used to give you a degassing feature, um, which would allow you to off gas if you have different chemicals that require that. For those of you who are who are, who are unfamiliar, um, chemicals, certain chemicals do off gas uh, in storage. And when dealing with um, smaller metering pumps or smaller injection pumps, that can become a real issue in your system um, whereby you can have, uh, and the most common culprit is gonna, is, 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 is gonna be um, hypochlorite or bleach. Um, anybody's open bottle chloride can smell the bleach coming off of it. And when you have a large volume of that, it's a very common disinfection chemical. Basically very, very small gas bubbles will actually rise up and get into your pump. And this can cause a lot of issues where the base of the pump becomes gas trapped, where essentially it's trying to activate and really all it has in it is gas. Um, so it does not actually allow you to either then to be able to lose prime, you get very inaccurate flow meetings. Um, when they become a real issue um, in a lot of different applications. So degassing technology has actually evolved quite a bit over the years. Um, outside of just the pump, people will utilize um, ball valves or just different check valves that are also degassing. The valves themselves can also trap um, the gas coming off of different chemicals. Um, some of the new degas technologies out there, um, some of the smarter metering pumps, such as the Grunfos that are on the market, actually have integral sensors that will actually run a degas program where they basically uh, run the pump at a very high speed, causing a vibration to basically shake the pump, basically, like a better technical term, shake the, basically shake um, the gas out of the pump. And this has shown a lot of good repeatability um, when you're dealing with some of those gaseous chemicals. So something definitely to bear in mind based on the chemicals you're using, but degassing in the system is also a very common issue that comes up in some of these kind of internal designs to a chemical speed system. Um, one, of the more, um, one of the more optional types of system technologies that do go into these is a pulsation dampener. And basically what pulsation dampeners do is, within, with, is they basically create um, an area, basically, it, basically it creates an inertial uh, boundary that basically smooths out and stops momentary spikes in pressure and flow. Most chemical, near, most chemical um, Feed systems that rely on a peristaltic style pump, which does have a pulsationary flow associated with it, uh, whereby your flow comes basically in small flirt and basically in small spurts. By adding a pulsation dampener into those systems, you're basically smoothing out that flow, um, which can be very helpful, especially when you have downstream technology like flow meters and things like that, which you're trying to monitor. It also, just kind of helps prevent a lot of the shock potentially that can come from some of the larger chemical um, metering pumps or, or larger chemical flow systems, especially using an A or B pump or something like that on your chemical injection system. And then finally, calibration columns. Um, calibration columns are, are used to provide flow verification of, of the chemical metering pump system. Um, they're still utilized, a lot of people actually use them also as a means for off-gassing. Um, they're also a good place because they're kind of atmospheric to allow for things like off-gassing to occur if you do have that concern within your system. 
Personally, I'm not a big fan of calibration columns that much anymore. I think a lot of nearing pumps, a lot of flow technology is kind of moving into more of a technology range uh, where you can do internal flow measurements um, in these different pumps. A lot of the more smarter pumps now in the market do integral flow monitoring and flow outputting. So while these are useful, um, I think they are slightly going away now to more digital and smarter technology that's an integral to the actual pump package as opposed to just using a basic calibration column in the future. And then lastly, coming off of your system, um, there are, um, you know, I'm really not actually a part of the chemical feed system, but at your actual point of use, there are injection valves or corporation stops, both of which are utilized to one prevents a backflow from your process as well as allow for um, a controlled injection generally either into the line or into the process that you're trying to do rather than kind of dropping it on top of your device. So as I mentioned you know before that's kind of a highlight of sort of you know what you know a very basic chemical feed system looks like and now we're going to talk a little bit about a lot of some of the different kind of options and customs and, you know, things that kind of go into these systems that kind of make them unique depending upon what the different applications are. And you can see here, this is kind of one, these are all, so these three systems here, I'm going to play a small video here on the right, on the left, I'm sorry, um, show, um, these show very large metering pumps uh, systems which are utilized actually in more of an industrial application that went outside. And in the video here, those are a couple of smart uh, metering pumps um, that's all PVDF piping in that case. And these were utilized, you can see here kind of the digital screen here. Um, I'm, they're basically doing all the flow measuring in those systems. And these were used for precision chemical injection. They were tying off to a, to a main PLC system. And they're still the polyethylene base with a three inch deep enclosure. Um, and these were sitting in a, um, in a custom enclosure um, to allow them to be utilized outside. Um, in this case, a, a, a hot box style enclosure, which you can see here in the images on the, um, in the middle and then on the right. And again, and this allowed them, they were located really outside in Oklahoma, um, tying into a primary feature here. Um, it's just some more of the features. These are pumping a lot of different technologies, a lot of different chemicals and sulfuric acid, the hypochlorite. And you had smaller metering pumps and then you had much bigger motor-based driven metering pumps as well. Um, the motor-based driven metering pumps are all VFD controlled in those cases. So um, depending on what your flow rates are, we haven't talked a ton about pumps yet. There is a lot of different technology which can be utilized within these systems. Um, and you can just see in the video, here are the kind of controlled um, boxes that were located over these, which do provide freeze, supervised freeze protection. Um, and more advanced ones can also provide air conditioning control as well as these types of systems, um, as well as giving them a splash proof um, control. And this allows these systems to be located outdoors. Very often, this is very common in fertilizers, oil and gas, and also even in um, municipal applications as well. Some of the more advanced ones, this is actually a full container-based system where they have a PLC-based design. Um, this is actually at a, a pharmaceutical-based facility where they were doing um, essentially a lot of pH control coming out of the chemical feed system here. This is full PLC, chemical safety shower integral to the actual unit. You can see here some of the chem feed equipment located within this container. It's actually a split wall. Um, we have acids and bases basically separated by a fireproof barrier uh, in between the two different sides of the container uh, to allow for a, um, to, you know, basically to allow for safety in those cases. Um, this is where you kind of take sort of the basic chem feed design and kind of move it into a little bit more of an industrial or process based equipment. And they were actually running some of the fluid you can see here actually through the actual container, they're actually doing the injection in there to basically not have to go to some of the heat tracing devices that were going on outside. 
um, in the actual system. Chemical systems can also be utilized for hazardous chemicals. Um, in this case here, these are a lot of times these are solvents or isopropyl alcohol injection. This is very common in semiconductor industry. Uh, where these basically are built into fireproof cabinets um, with a deep chemical injection, um, you know, 55 gallon drums. As you can see in kind of example here, you have a entirely stainless steel cabinet, class one div two or class one div one rated. Um, we have air operated diaphragm pumps, you know, the conservation vents located in the system. Some of the, and then you have much bigger ones like these. Um, and these are utilizing some of the larger, uh, again, we're doing with like a solvent based injections. So they're kind of moving a little bit away from some of the chemical feed, uh, but looking at some more of the different solvents you know, that can be utilized as well. These are some of the different features that go into the more custom based systems. And then this one here um, is also a hazardous location system. This is another industrial client. This is actually um, a, um, a crop science division. And these kind of, in, in, in this system, they're using API 675 metering pumps uh, for HCL injection. You can see the chemical feed system here. Um, these are the storage tanks, the actual mixing tanks involved. This is the uh, chemical injection system, all PVDF. API 675, flow verification, external VFDs located in the purge cabinet. This is kind of going up again from a very simple chemical feed system, kind of more transitioning into what things be done. Um, it's sort of more the custom realm uh, for these types of systems. So, kind of taking a step back from some of the, the custom here, you can see here, this, you know, as a standard, and as I mentioned before, for positive equipment, and a lot of people do as well, have a have have kind of a standard chemical feed system that can be taken in a lot of different directions. Again, whether it goes into environmental enclosures, containers, PLC, whether it's small, a couple of gallons per hour, whether it's large, you know, you know, a couple of GPM, BFD based, different pumps, they all fall within you know the standard ones are really a customizable standard. Um, but as a standard, brew process does have a few different options. It's simplex, you know, a couple of different duplex arrangements, whether that be um, duplex redundant or duplex um, uh, lead lag, a single piping system as well as triplex. And a lot of the more standard system options, flow and pressure, splash guards, we talked about, we showed you the video, you showed you the video before, and elevated legs as well. Looking at basically a basic simplex design of a system, um, you have your pump, whether that be a metering pump, air operated diaphragm pump, a uh, gear pump. Um, drawing off of your source, you have your Y strainer or chemical strainer here. This is your calibration column. A lot of times we you know, you do use flux connectors in these systems. That's true to kind of prevent some of that pulsation, which can occur uh, when you're looking at some of the different. Um, you know, some of the different pumping technologies, um, you know, that be, you have, you have like an air operated diaphragm pump that requires a lot more pulsations in the system. Um, you have your pulsate, this is your pulsation dampener. You have your, you have your back pressure, you have your pressure relief valve, back pressure valve, and then you have your discharge out. That's a basic chem plus, that's a basic chemical feed system as a standard simplex arrangement. The duplex arrangement. Uh, is the same except you have you have a common feed source splitting off, and then you have a common discharge tying together. These don't necessarily have to tie together; they can be totally separated. In some cases, you'll do duplex systems that will actually draw two different chemicals. I just put them on one skid um, as an example. Uh, duplex lead lag. This is really if you want a simplex system, you just want the built-in redundancy to the system. We'll have two pumps that basically just alternate back and forth uh, for even wear, or you have one as like an installed spare. Um, when you have a very similar, you have basically the same uh, chemical feed systems dying into them. You have the same uh, inlet and then the same discharge coming off. As well as triplex based systems, which again are basically just three different pumps in a row. Triplex is fairly common because a lot of times these systems need to have a lot of built in redundancy in the system. I think the largest one I've seen is with five pumps for redundancy, which 
it's probably a little bit on the excessive side, but uh, triplex based configuration are very common when it comes to different chem feed based systems. All of these systems are, fair, are, are thoroughly tested um, and this test report's all available. It's very important when dealing with these things. They are dealing with very strong chemicals in some cases. You know, you could be dealing with 50% or 93% sulfuric acid, hydrofluorophilic acid, um, you know, different chlorides. You know, it depends on what you're pumping, but it's very important because there is leaks in these systems. Um, while other issues, it does become very critical of uh, a system operation. So all these systems are given a two-hour hydrostatic test, pressure relief, back pressure, pulsation charge. Um, and then on site, you know, very often they're given startup training as well. Um, leak sensors can be installed in these systems, and all the chemicals that are utilized in them are also usually grade um, because you don't want to inadvertently utilize them on the wrong chemical. Um, because it can be catastrophic reactions as a result. So safety does play a lot of role with these types of technologies. So again, it's not just like a water or base stream, you're pumping the actual raw chemicals. Um, and very often in very high pressures out of these types of systems. Well, that brings us to the end. Um, we do have a few questions, so I wanted to go back through those. And if you have any more questions, certainly feel free to type them in. Uh, before I get to those, just wanted to let everybody know that there are a couple more webinars coming up here um, at the end. There'll be another there'll be another webinar uh, next month on June 17th, which will be on solvent-based systems. And then there'll probably be a small break in the summertime. I hope everybody can enjoy their summer this summer. And we'll be doing a high purity water system design um, webinar, um, which will be which will take place on September 23rd. And then there'll be another webinar yet to be announced, probably most likely uh, in November. So again, the questions the question window is open. So I'm going to answer a few here. If you guys have any more, feel free to type them in. Again, any questions we don't get to now, uh, we will get to um, a little bit later. So. First question, can I elaborate a little bit more on the degassing requirements and different degassing technologies utilized in chemical feed systems? Sure, so as I mentioned, different chemicals such as hypochlorite is really the big offender. What can basically happen is um, as you're drawing off of your steel chemical, and you have you basically have now you're basically drawing pressure um, off as you basically draw the chemical into the pump. You are putting a bit of a negative pressure on that. By doing that, you can cause a solution such as bleach, which is very common, that has a low vapor pressure to essentially begin to off gas. And in that case, is what you can not end up with is kind of like what you're looking at the top of a soda bottle if you shake it. You kind of see a very thick layer of like bubbles. And that can basically begin to fill uh, your entire line through the pump and actually into the actual pump head. So once the pump begins to try to operate, it doesn't actually have a prime anymore of solution. It's now basically trying to draw like a kind of like a fizzy looking bubble top that you see at the top like a soda bottle. So to kind of prevent that, you need to cause a lot of vibration. You need to basically either extinguish the gas from the system, but you can't. And you need, but generally that is done by giving it some kind of actual, actual vibration. So there is like degas ports, which you can then open up and allow that gas to escape. But at the same time, you can also um, utilize the um, modern pumps now, which are basically like the smart pumps, have the ability to actually kind of pulsate through um, the. Um, basically pulsate the pump to allow them to basically extinguish the pump, basically basically push, almost like a plunger to basically push. And kind of, it's, it's, it's kind of like, it's, it's kind of just giving a shake off the top to kind of like throw the bubbles basically out of the pump head at that point. And it's very loud when they activate. So it's kind of like this sort of like, almost like a lawnmower go and it kind of like shakes the pump very violently, which causes the bubble to then rise out of it. So hypo is not the only one where that's an issue, but it is one um, which is very common. Talking about the polymer systems here for a second, 
Um, could you review when and why you may install an aging tank on a liquid polymer system? So aging, as I kind of said before, um, there's, there's a couple of areas where you would use um, aging, uh, aging tanks in a system. So if you're doing a dry polymer system, that blending tank essentially operates as the aging tank. And aging um, for polymers varies tremendously whether or not you have, uh, it really depends on what type of polymer you have and also how much initial activation energy you put into the um, initial activation of the polymer. So you're talking about a liquid polymer based system. You generally don't, if you put sufficient energy in um, to activate the polymer, then you don't actually, you really, really don't need an aging tank for those, and aging can be detrimental. If, um, if you feel like you haven't put enough energy in and you're not getting good results, that's where you may want to put an aging tank in um, to give the polymer more time to effectively allow it to activate. Um, the downside of doing that is if your water is not very clean, the polymer that you have activated can actually begin to react with the, well, with the fluid, and that can cause um, the polymer to then begin to basically deactivate in those cases to some degree. So it is kind of a mix. It's kind of a mixed bag um, with those systems, and um, that's but so. Most people don't use aging tanks, I would say. You gotta, I would probably say you're probably better off going to a two-stage activation rather than going to the infrastructure of putting in an actual aging tank um, for your system. One more question. One more, how high of a, next question, how high of a flow can you realistically achieve with a metering pump? Um, it kind of depends. Um, so if you're talking about a electric solenoid driven metering pump, you're gonna be probably capped at around, you know, about a half a GPM. It's probably about as big as, as an electronic driven metering pump can go. Um, if you go to motor driven metering pumps, those can go up to probably 15 to almost 20 gallons per minute. Um, there is kind of a trade-off when you get to the very large metering pumps. You don't have the same electronics if now you're talking about a motor-based system. And um, so they do require VFDs in those cases. They act a little bit differently um, at that level and you do lose some of the turn down as well um, when going to some of the larger metering pumps. So sometimes it may be more beneficial if you have a high flow application to move away from a metering pump and a chemical injection system. Um, and then go more to maybe like a gear, you know, like a gear pump or a progressive cavity pump or something like that. Um, in those cases, it is obviously very chemical dependent um, on what the systems are. Last question. One more question here. Um, so what, what is the true downside of utilizing more of a, um, of a mechanical shear mixer on the polymer versus the hydropneumatic? I've seen some issues where hydropneumatic systems don't give enough activation. So hydropneumatic, the hydropneumatic activation in polymer, you, you do need to have sufficient pressure. You need to size it properly to ensure that you do end up with enough energy. All times, if you don't have enough energy, it's because you probably have an insufficient city water flow um, to the actual polymer to get that true uh, velocity you need in the inductor um, to get that activation. And some polymers are just different than others. Polymer chemistry is a little bit, and we spend a ton of time today talking about polymers and generally polymer chemistry. Uh, which I can certainly do offline if anybody's interested. I am actually a chemical, I'm a chemist by trade. They can get into, um, different polymers do activate differently. So if you do use a mechanic, mechanical, you can kind of control a little bit better or control the duration of the atmosphere, example, the aging tank, um, what you would need to do um, as far as that activation process is concerned. 
with the hydrogen microscope, it's kind of a one-shot deal. So sometimes it is, depending on the polymer you want to use, best to put them in some kind of a combination. But also increasing the flow rate through the system um, can also allow that to get, sometimes you're just not quite getting enough of that velocity um, going through your system. All right. Well, it is 2 o'clock. It is 2 o'clock here. So uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. If there's any more questions, you can certainly feel free to reach out to me and I will um, certainly answer those in email. Again, there will be kind of a, a little bit of a survey as well as a link to those who uh, had to leave early or to those who joined late. Again, I want to thank you all and hope everyone is staying safe and uh, have a great Memorial Day weekend. Thank you.